Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. We hope you enjoy listening to this podcast of St. Louis on the Air, brought to you by University College at Washington University. With undergraduate and graduate programs, part-time, evening, and online. University College at Washington University, offering world-class education within reach. Tim O'Leary has been the driving force behind Opera Theater St. Louis for a decade. As general director of OTSL, he has led the organization and excelled at innovative programming, fundraising, and developing a broader, more diverse audience. It's paid off. He's moving on to Washington, D.C. as general director of the Washington National Opera. His new office will be in the Kennedy Center, a very prestigious address. I sat down with Tim O'Leary a few days ago and suggested that his move is definitely a big jump. Well, it's a new adventure, and I'm excited about it. As the date approaches, I, I, we finish off the opera theater season on June 24th, and then I move on July 1st. So I'm getting very nostalgic about St. Louis and how much I love it here. But it's an exciting adventure because Washington National Opera is an affiliate of the Kennedy Center, and that's where we perform. It's a great organization and has the added sort of wonderfulness of being part of the Kennedy Center, which is all about trying to represent the greatness of the American people through art. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful, exciting journey ahead. Uh, really a tribute uh, to you, certainly, but uh, to Opera Theater St. Louis for what position it must hold in the opera world to have selected you. Oh, well, you're kind. You know, the Washington National Opera, which is, th there's a great artistic director there named Francesca Zambello, who actually directed at Opera Theater of St. Louis years ago, was one of the places where she got her start. And she's always been one of my heroes in the opera world. So now I'll, I'll be collaborating with her. And one of the things that's exciting is that her vision of what opera is all about and what the arts mean in our culture mm -hmm. is very much, uh, you know, what I've been so excited about here for the whole 10 years. And actually, James Robinson, who is our artistic director, and Francesca Zambello are colleagues, and, uh, I mean, they're, they're sort of two sides of a coin. They're very similar in their mm -hmm. artistic outlook. Uh, and so this is an exciting uh, new adventure. And your successor here is coming from, <laughs> from Washington. Washington. What's going on here? Well, it's confusing. <laughs> but uh, so Andrew Jorgensen, who's now general director designate of Opera Theater of St. Louis, is one of the great rising stars in our business. He's 34 years old. I was 33 mm -hmm. when I was lucky enough to get this job in St. Louis. Andrew has been the director of artistic operations and planning for Washington National Opera. Mm -hmm. And actually, when... You remember a few years ago we premiered an opera called Champion by Terrence oh, yeah, Blanchard, sure. co-commissioned with Jazz St. Louis, opera in jazz, kind of a groundbreaking piece. Well, that eventually went to the Kennedy Center with the Washington National Opera, and it was thanks to Andrew Jorgensen, mm -hmm. who came to St. Louis and saw the production and thought, this is exactly the kind of thing we should be doing at the Kennedy Center, and he brought the production with Francesca to Washington. Well, so I've been working with Andrew for years. He's, mm -hmm. he's one of the people I've most enjoyed working with as a colleague in the opera world. And I was excited to work with him there. That was mm -hmm. part of what drew me to this company. And then the Opera Theater Board of Directors Search Committee went and hired Andrew out from under my feet in Washington. Yeah. And when he told me, he and I went out to dinner one of the nights I was in Washington. We've been working together closely on the transition there. When he told me uh, that he'd gotten a call from the Opera Theater Board, I thought, well, this is over. He's going to get the job there. And, and I said, Andrew... It's a wonderful job. You'll be lucky to get it, and, uh, and I'll support you wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. So we've been downloading all the information we can to one another about both companies for the past several months. What sort of adjustments will he have to make coming here, and will you have to make going there? Right. Well, you know, like I said, the artistic ambitions of both companies are actually quite similar. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, you know, uh, Opera Theater St. Louis is known for championing great American rising talent, doing the new and the unusual and, and the newsworthy as far as new world premieres and, and works that speak to the issues of our times. Well, those values are similar in both companies. Opera Theater is a much smaller organization, St. Louis. We're, we're $10.5 million. Washington National Opera is, depends how you count it, but it's, it's any time, anywhere between two and three times the size. And it's a big opera house. The Kennedy Center Opera House is a, is a major 
venue uh, with a lot of seats. So they, they, they do the big operas. The, they, they did a famous ring cycle directed by Francesca Zambella, Wagner's Ring, which mm-hmm. is like the Mount Everest of opera. Uh, that's the kind of thing we could never do in St. Louis for a million reasons, but one of them is that our orchestra pit is just not big enough. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in a way, what's amazing is how you know, because we have the St. Louis Symphony as our artistic partner and they play in the pit for opera theater, uh, because we have uh, casts of uh, this sort of blend of international caliber ar- artists in St. Louis and the up-and-coming stars of tomorrow, it's funny how how there's more similarities than differences, I'd say. What are you looking forward to doing? Uh, what kind of production? You've mentioned uh, Wagner. <laughs> what what uh, other kinds of things do you think that you've been unable to do here that you really are looking forward to doing there? Well, I'll tell you. The, um, one of the things I've most loved about my time in St. Louis has been the collaboration with organizations throughout town. So we produce opera, and that's our thing. We, we It's human expression through opera, but it's all about how it connects to people's lives and how we make the community of St. Louis better, stronger, more beautiful uh, through the kinds of uh, you know topics that are raised in the art and the connections that result. So, so you know, here I've I've been so privileged to work with organizations like the Diversity Awareness Partnership and the Urban League mm-hmm. and uh, the Interfaith Partnership in St. Louis. Now an organization called Arts and Faith, all about you know um, how do we through the arts find our common humanity through artistic expression, bring people together for common purpose. Well, in Washington, there's all these other incredible organizations to collaborate with, and they are local to D.C., but also national in scope. So there's the new African American Museum of History and Culture, for example. It's part of the Smithsonian. You know, There are enormously great opportunities for collaboration and cross-fertilization that the Kennedy Center and Washington National Opera have been taking advantage of, and this is exactly the kind of thing I want to build on. What about diversity of audience for opera? Well, I'm glad you asked because Opera Theater St. Louis has been on the leading edge of prioritizing a strategy for building audiences that reflect the demographics of our whole region. That's our big, audacious goal at Opera Theater. I mean, it's no secret. The opera audience, if you look historically, has been an older white audience, generally speaking. Now, Opera Theater of St. Louis has always had an adventurous spirit and has done a lot of interesting works that bring in a diversity of audience members and Mm -hmm. supporters. But it's something we've paid a lot of attention to in recent years. Uh, We've been a leader in building audiences in the millennial and Gen X generations, and also uh, diverse, you know, non-white audiences. Uh, we, we've gotten an, an award from the Wallace Foundation to focus on a multi-year strategy that's all about building this 21st century opera audience mm-hmm. of the future. So this is a, a kind of work that I'm really looking forward to engaging with in Washington. With the Kennedy Center, you have this incredible team of professionals in the marketing and PR departments. There's actually quite a lot of opportunity there. What kind of strategies could be developed and employed in in reaching this objective? Well, I'll tell you, it begins with what you produce on stage. You know, opera is a 400-year history of mostly Western European creations, Mm -hmm. right? So the idea that it has generally been people of European descent thus far who have been the opera audience is no surprise if you if you think of sure. it that way. Well, but now we're in 21st century America, and opera is increasingly a 21st century American art form. A lot of the greats of opera creation today, composers and librettists, are the Americans. And so commissioning something like we did from Terence Blanchard, one of the great jazz artists of our time, multi-Grammy award-winning composer, composer of incredibly beautiful, meaningful, ambitious music to write his first opera, which he did with Champion. Mm -hmm. Well, that became a sellout world premiere. It had uh, by far the most diverse audience we'd ever gathered at Opera Theater of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just what we produced on the stage. It's that we prepared through this incredible series of partnerships throughout the community to spread the word. I like to joke, Mm -hmm. Champion was a hit before it opened because everybody in St. Louis, it seemed, had met Terrence Blanchard, heard him speak, heard his jazz quintet play at Free Parks concerts that were sponsored by the Whitaker Foundation. So this is the kind of sort of whole institution effort, artistic programming, but also 
partnership, marketing, and then it's how we talk about our art form. We did a bunch of focus groups in St. Louis, and we talked to diverse, you know, members of the Gen X and millennial cohorts. And some of them were people who had come to our operas, and some of them were people who not only hadn't come, but wouldn't come, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and we started talking to them about, what, what, what do you think opera is? That This is the person running the focus group. And, of course, there's a lot of negative stereotypes. Opera is, is elitist. It's, it's difficult. It's sure. weird, all this stuff. And then the, the leader of the focus group starts telling them about Opera Theater of St. Louis. Well, what if I told you that they perform all their performances in English and that they commission, you know, cutting-edge works like, you know, an opera in jazz or this season we have An American Soldier by Huang Ro and David Henry Huang all about events from 2011, the whole question of who gets counted as American. It's about the story of Danny Chen who joined the U.S. Army in order to serve his country and to be seen as fully American. You know, the focus group keeps learning about Opera Theater of St. Louis. What if I told you there's a, a picnic beforehand mm-hmm. and everyone, you know, shows up and has a food and drink before the opera and then afterwards you get to meet all the singers and there's a tent where everyone gathers for drinks afterwards and you don't need a special ticket to mix and mingle with the singers. Everybody's invited. Well, by the time the group gets all that information, they say, I'd love to come to that. That sounds fabulous. Mm-hmm. So I joked, if we did enough focus groups, we'd have this huge and diverse audience because everyone would, would know about the experience. Is this something you, you'll bring to Washington? And will there be picnics? Will there be operas <laughs> in English? Of course, uh, one way to have operas in English is to commission new operas that are written right. in English so that they are in the original language. And then, yep. of course, we do a lot of that in St. Louis. I'll tell you, I, of course, Washington National Opera is a company that generally performs in the original language. There are some operas like Mozart's The Magic Flute that work brilliantly in translation and and major opera companies all over the world uh, do them in translation. So we'll generally do original language because that's what the audience there is used Mm -hmm. to and all that. But the whole socializing before and after the performance, to me, the performance is obviously the center of what we offer. Mm -hmm. But what we're really offering people is a fun social experience that's about connecting with the people that they love in their lives, mm-hmm. their family members, their friends. So that's about what you do before and after. So yes, I'm very interested in bringing some of the Opera Theater of St. Louis mentality to the Washington National Opera, sure. What kind of a bullpen is there in this uh, in this particular industry, if you will? How many Terrence Blanchards are out there? How many young millennial composers, yeah. librettists, are there out there? You know, the truth is there's this huge groundswell going on right now. Yeah. So we're about to host the Opera America Conference in St. Louis mm-hmm. this week. We're having 700 colleagues from all over the country gather in St. Louis. The, the whole focus mm-hmm. of the conference just about is on these generation change issues and equity, inclusion, and diversity in the opera world about who's creating new works and who, which voices get heard. And it is incredible. Jim Robinson, our artistic director, says, you know, it used to be that only certain composers would deign to try to write an opera. And suddenly it seems like now every composer from every genre <laughs> is saying, you know what I really want to do is write an opera. Mm-hmm. It's a powerful way to tell a story. And all it is is music and theater in complete combination, mm-hmm. right? And so what defines opera is increasingly a broad spectrum of uh, kinds of expression. People have asked me, isn't Hamilton an opera? Mm-hmm. Well, the short answer is basically yes, Hamilton mm-hmm. is an opera. Mm-hmm. It's just, uh, you know, which tools do we use, which genres, which kinds of voices? Was Porgy and Bess an opera? Porgy and Bess is both the province of Broadway musical theater type organizations and opera houses, mm-hmm. and it succeeds in both contexts, as do works like we've done, like Sweeney Todd and A Little Night Music mm-hmm. by Stephen Sondheim. Yeah. And Sondheim Mm. likes to say, if an opera company produces it, it's an opera. (laughs) If it's on Broadway, it's a musical. What really matters is the terrain. The the idea of of expansion of audience, and it's really the future, isn't it? We talk about the millennials. It's a larger group than the baby boomers. Right. And they are the future of, of everything, of this business, your business, and everything else. That's right. One of the things, because I've gotten involved in all this demographic research about audience trends, one of the first things I came to understand is that part of what's going on, opera and every other kind of live performing art, you know, the subscription audience, there are fewer and fewer subscribers. Mm-hmm. But that's because there's a generation change going on, and the people mm-hmm who have been the the kind of people that built up our subscription bases for the past 30 years, they are aging out of that 
habit. And millennials, they are very interested in what's going on, but they're very unlikely to buy a full subscription to your opera company or symphony or anything else a year in advance. They're going to pick up their smartphones on the, the week before or the night of and decide what they're going to do. That's how people live their lives nowadays. Mm -hmm. And so the question is not whether there's a future because they're interested in what we do. They actually really are interested in what we do if we cause them to really understand what it is and communicate with them in ways that they're ready to receive. You know, you mentioned uh, the smartphones and all the rest of the yeah. digital world obviously is here and here to stay. How can that be utilized, or is it being utilized in the world of opera? Well, yes, it's, uh, of course, uh, both a profound opportunity, and if I'm very honest, it's, it's one of our principal areas of concern, because what's happening with digital media is that the audience expectation is increasingly that you can get great stuff for free or cheap at the touch of a screen. And it used to be that if you wanted a truly excellent artistic experience, well, that was the province of concert halls, theaters, opera houses, etc. And a lot of what was on television, for example, just wasn't going to be at that same level. The incredible array of what's streamable on Netflix or Amazon now and the high quality of what's being produced is actually a, a huge sea change in our culture. And so I see that as uh, both something that we have to be deeply aware of. People have lots of choices about how to spend their time and money, but also it's, a, it's an exciting challenge because what we have to offer in a live performance is that it's got to be better. It's got to be better than what you can experience streaming on your smartphone or iPad. And it is better for a very important reason when it's great, mm -hmm. which is that you're in a community of people. When you come to a live theater, and in Opera Theater of St. Louis, 987 seats, everybody packed together. We, we, you know, we're in our last week of the season, full houses and an electric energy once the performance starts, an experience that you can only get because of the exchange of energy between the audience and the stage and throughout the audience. It's magic. It's deeply moving. And it's only available if you leave your house and come to a live event like an opera. Yeah, Aida on a smartphone uh, isn't going to cut it. Well, you know, of course, what the streaming has done is, of course, a lot of people have just much more access than they used to have. And, and opera companies, including ours, are really savvy now about providing content on digital platforms. But of course, it's not going to be the same experience. Our experience is about an immersive moving physical experience. It's literally the physical vibrations created by the sounds of voices and instruments oh. that move people. Yeah, and the speaker on an iPhone is the size of a dime. <laughs> That's right. You know, the quality is not going to be there. No, I'm very upfront with people about this. I actually don't like to listen to opera generally on the radio. Mm. No offense to radio. I love the radio. This interview will stop. Yeah, right no. Now. <laughs> but I don't listen to opera that, that much on the radio mm. because it doesn't even begin yeah. to do justice to the beauty of the sound. Mm. And when we do, th so we do things called opera tastings. We bring our singers, our world class singers, and a baby grand piano into bars and restaurants throughout all the you know uh, communities of this community. And people, for a very low price, come and have food and drink while they hear the sound of this incredible music. And it's up close and personal. People have these conversion moments. People are moved to tears, and they say, I have never heard a voice like that in my life. I've, I've seen this happen on movies where people break down in tears at the sound of the mm -hmm. voice, but I never imagined that would happen to me. And it does, because the, the sound is unimaginably beautiful. But you have to hear it live. Yeah. You, know, you you have a reputation as someone who has innovative and taken risks during your 10 years here in St. Louis. Do you think you'll have the freedom in Washington to be a risk taker as you have been here? Well, I hope that one of the reasons they engaged me is the, the body of work that I've done here. And, and it hasn't been me alone. Oh, I've, sure. been had, I've worked with great collaborators like James Robinson and Stephen Lord. But yes, as arts organizations, we have to be embracing risk, risk, artistic risk, which is not to say irrational risks that have no hope of uh, succeeding, but artistic risk, uh, engaging uh, composers to write their first opera, stretching the 
the definitions of the art form, taking on topics that are deeply meaningful because they're about recent events like an American soldier. This is what excites and motivates a creative organization. It's what motivates donors to, to want to support an organization because they're supporting something that has meaning in their community. And if you do it right, if you set things up for success, then you can have an audience that really embraces what you're producing as well. Of course, it's no good to just say, oh, I'm the new guy. I'm going to program a bunch of things that I know you're not going to like, but trust me, it's good for you. That won't succeed. Uh, It's a strategy of evolution. What is the biggest risk you took during your time in St. Louis? (laughs) It may have been Champion, actually. Of course, many people might say producing John Adams' The Death of Klinghoffer, which was a very, very controversial opera because of its subject matter. And it would have to be a sort of toss-up between those two projects. The opera in jazz, Champion, was a risk artistically. It also dealt with a topic that was deeply meaningful. Uh, You know, the, the main character is a closeted gay boxer who becomes welterweight champion of the world, Emil Griffith, true story. This was not your usual operatic fare. And I I have to say, on opening night of Champion, we had a sold-out theater and this electricity in the air and massive expectation, and none of us, including me, knew at all how it would turn out. It's an opera that includes strong language, all this frank depiction on stage of human sexuality and violence, and then forgiveness, ultimately, and redemption. So the story pulled the audience so thoroughly along. By the end of the night, the audience is cheering for the main character. They just want him to find happiness and relief. And the opera ends, standing ovation, instant, you know, wholehearted yelling from this great St. Louis audience. And I thought, well, I'll get to keep my job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I certainly understand all of that. But, you know, you mentioned the death of Klinghoffer. Yeah. When I heard that that was, you know, going to be produced uh, as, as an opera, I was astonished. I said, they can't do that. But in, in thinking about it, it's really testimony as to what the ability of opera can be and do when it's done right. That's right. Well, J- John Adams, great American composer, was one of the first to, and by the way, he's our keynote speaker at the Opera America conference coming up. He was one of the first to embrace this kind of almost ripped from the headlines. Let's take on the issues of today in opera. So the death of Klinghoffer tells the story, the, the tragic and true story of Leon Klinghoffer, who was executed by Palestinian terrorists uh, aboard the Achille Lauro cruise ship, an act of senseless violence. And it's ultimately a story about the senselessness of that kind of violence. But the opening, the reason the opera is so controversial is that it has as its backdrop the the whole Palestinian-Israeli conflict, deeply emotional issue, complex issue, about which I learned a great deal through this project. So it opens with a, a, a chorus of exiled Jews and then a chorus of exiled Palestinians. It is very powerful stuff. And what made it success, I believe, in St. Louis was this incredible collaboration. We worked with an organization called the Michael and Barbara Newmark Institute for Human Relations, uh, part of the Jewish Community Relations Council. Mm -hmm. They helped us put together an interfaith steering committee of civic and faith leaders, uh, Christian, Muslim, Jewish. How can we make sure that this is a positive experience for our community, that we learn about our differences through our common humanity, through this story depicted in artistic expression. I have to say, it was a very challenging, at times frightening experience for me, for Opera Theatre of St. Louis. We grew, we learned, people were connected and deeply moved by the events leading up to the opera, and then the opera itself. It made me feel convinced that this is the kind of challenge we should take on. Well, time is winding down for you, uh, just a couple of weeks left, but you're going to be busy. You know, there's, there's some things going on that are going to kept, uh, capture your attention. That's right. We're in the final week of the season here, so we have all four operas continuing to run. 
this smash hit of Regina, an opera by Mark Blitzstein, featuring like the greatest stars alive today. Yeah. Susan Graham, who began her career here as an unknown soprano. Loved talking to her when she was here. Oh, my goodness. That's right. She was on the show. <laughs> she's just one of the greatest stars in, in opera today, and she's back in St. Louis starring as Regina, bringing the house down night after night. We've had, we just had this incredible series of reviews in like the Wall Street Journal and the New York yeah. Times raving about that work about an American soldier. And then we, the last opera to open was uh, Gluck's Orfeo, which is the rare opera with a completely joyfully happy ending. Mm-hmm. And in the way that we produce it, it's, out, it's an outrageously happy ending. The audience leaves with huge grins on their faces mm-hmm. because it's about the redemptive power of love. And so we're presenting all of this Oh, I forgot to say La Traviata by Verdi, one of the greatest Mm. operas in the history of the world and most beloved. But we're presenting all of this while 700 of our closest friends from all over the country and beyond are here for the Opera America Conference. So it's really an exciting week at Opera Theater St. Louis. Happens to be my last official week mm-hmm. on the job, and uh, it's it's I'm hugely grateful for these opportunities. Well, the uh, community here in St. Louis is hugely grateful for what you've brought to it over the last ten years, Tim. We wish you the very very best in Washington D.C. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about you from uh, that part of the world. Don, thank you so much. Timothy O'Leary leaving his position as General Director of Opera Theatre St. Louis for a similar position with the Washington National Opera. He starts the new job on July 1st. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.